There are a few different techniques that have been tried for defending against man in the browser attacks. And as with any countermeasure for any type of attack, each technique that you might employ uh, would have its own set of pros and cons. So for starters, the most basic thing you can do is simply try to block the threat from getting onto the system in the first place. And here you can rely on the most traditional approaches. And, and by traditional approaches, I mean things like uh, anti-malware technology or IPS technology. So uh, these are things that have been around for a long time and uh, anti-malware, IPS, and so on. These techniques will help actually keep a lot of that malware off your environment in the first place. Um, you can also do things like, for example, ensuring that the machine is patched appropriately against uh, all the latest vulnerabilities and exploits and, and that type of thing. And in general, these approaches will keep some of the malware off the system. Now, of course, even if you employ all of these approaches and have all these capabilities in place, the reality is that many times threats still get through. In fact, I did a separate series of videos and, and chalk talks called Why Threats Get Through that really dive into this topic of why this type of thing does happen even though we put our best foot forward in terms of putting the, the best defenses in place. Now some anti-malware vendors and even some uh, special purpose security vendors have tried to detect man in the browser attacks through other more sophisticated means. Uh, for example, some of them look at things like uh, behavioral attributes. They do what's called behavioral analysis. And the idea behind behavioral analysis is to look for uh, attributes that might be indicative of an attack taking place at a low level uh, and in a more general level. Now the challenge with these approaches is that there can be many legitimate instances where uh, similar behaviors occur even though the application is not trying to do something malicious. So for example, if you saw the previous video, I mentioned that looking for API hooks will certainly allow you to identify potential man in the browser behavior, but it'll also identify a lot of legitimate behavior as well. Now there are ways to improve behavioral analysis techniques, uh, but in general, I think there's always a risk, always a risk of a false positive occurring when you do behavioral analysis. And by false positive, I mean a situation in which a legitimate application is deemed malicious because it performs an action that, at least at a low level, ostensibly resembles the kind of action performed by a malicious application. Now, in general, the challenge with any type of behavioral analytics technique is that Understanding an application's behavior is not the same thing as understanding the intent associated with that behavior. Understanding intent is a lot harder to do, at least algorithmically or in some type of more generic fashion. So let me actually switch gears here a bit in terms of countermeasures and talk a bit about what financial institutions and other organizations can do to help really mitigate the risk of man in the browser trojans. Uh, so the first thing I want to point out is that mechanisms for trying to secure authentication processes, things like uh, two-factor authentication that you might have heard about in other videos, or back-end transaction analytics, and so on, uh, these techniques actually do not work that well in the context of preventing man-in-the-browser attacks. And the reason is that in a man-in-the-browser attack, the malware basically will first wait for a user to establish a connection. So for example, if you have a computer uh, and there's a web browser on that computer and the user is using their web browser to connect uh, to the internet, uh, what's going to happen is that, let's say you have a user and they use their browser and the, the browser is connecting to the bank's website and we'll put the bank out here. Uh, the man in the browser trojan is going to first wait for that session to be established. It's going to wait for the user to transmit their username and password and, and two-factor token value and so on and establish a secure, authenticated connection with their bank, and then the malware is going to piggyback on top of that connection and modify things like transaction details and, and that sort of thing. So really, the malware is piggybacking on top of a legitimate session. So you have a legitimate session in which fraudulent behavior is taking place. Okay, and again, I did a series of chalk talks on two-factor authentication, in particular, there's one talk on two-factor authentication and session writing trojans that I would encourage you to watch. Uh, but the upshot is that even though the transactions themselves are fraudulent, the user is legitimately logged in over a legitimate authenticated channel. So instead, what banks and organizations have done is employed other mechanisms for trying to detect uh, these types of uh, man-of-the-browser trojans. Uh, so first of all, one mechanism uh, 
that a lot of banks have employed, and this is maybe a bank side mechanism, is to use what's known as out of band, and I'm gonna label as OOB, out of band transaction confirmation. All right, this is something you might have actually seen in, in practice. So what will typically happen in this case is that uh, the bank will provide a user with a transaction confirmation regarding any transaction they've done, but through a, a different channel than the channel over which the transaction actually took place initially. Uh, so for example, the user might receive an email with the transaction details. The user might receive a, a cell phone text message or a message on their phone, something along those lines, something that's different from receiving the confirmation on the browser. Uh, so maybe I can make that more concrete. Imagine you have, again, this user here, and, and let's say the user has been infected with a man in the browser Trojan. And let's say that the user has initiated a transaction. Let's say Alice wants to transact uh, uh, $10 to Bob. Okay, so Alice wants to give $10 to Bob. And let's say the man in the browser Trojan has modified that $10 and made it $100 and has modified Bob to some malicious party, Mallory. All right, the user might think they're transacting with Bob, but instead they really are transacting with Mallory because that's what the man in the browser Trojan has done. When the bank receives this fraudulent transaction, it'll, let's say, do whatever needs to be done on its side, and then maybe it'll send an email now back to, or even an email or maybe a text message, we'll go back to, to Alice. But the text message is gonna contain what the bank saw, and the bank, has seen a different transaction than what the user thought. So the bank's seen the transaction of um, $100 going to Mallory. And so what's gonna happen now is Alice will see the bank's confirmation and they'll see, hey, the bank's confirmation says $100 to Mallory, even though I said $10 to Bob, clearly something has gone wrong here, all right? Now, it's worth stressing that this particular technique doesn't stop the attack, it doesn't prevent it, but the hope is that as long as the malware has not compromised the out-of-band channel, as long as the malware is not modifying the email confirmation or has not modified what's going on on the cell phone, uh, which, which seems a lot less likely to modify or really compromise everything that the user has access to, at least in this case, Alice, the user, can detect that a fraudulent transaction has taken place because Alice knows that she wanted to transact with Bob and now she's received a confirmation about a transaction with Mallory. All right, so in this particular case, um, at least Alice has the, the ability to now report that behavior to the bank, and if that reporting is done in enough time, the bank can potentially reverse the transaction or block it or, or do something along those lines. Of course, the challenge now is that the onus of reporting this malicious behavior is now on Alice because she's the only one who realizes there's a discrepancy between what she wanted to do and what seems to have happened ultimately, all right? I also do want to point out that it's entirely possible that the malware has compromised the channel over which the transaction confirmation takes place as well. And we've actually seen this happen before, where the attacker has not only developed malware that does a man in the browser attack to compromise the victim's computer, but the attacker has also developed malware that runs on the victim's mobile phone and modifies any transaction confirmation details that are received on that phone. It's obviously harder for an attacker not to compromise two different devices in two different ways, but it's still within the realm of possibility. The risk is reduced, but it's not entirely eliminated. So another approach that, that banks have taken uh, in this case is, and this is maybe a bit more of a generic approach, is to modify the way their web page looks. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, this is actually, to understand this, you have to understand that at a low level, uh, what's gonna happen when you have a, a man in the browser Trojan, at a low level, that Trojan has to understand how the bank's web page is structured. It has to understand uh, what actually takes place when there's a transaction between the user and the bank uh, at a low level. It has to understand, for example, uh, imagine that there's this browser underneath the hood, um, there's an encoding, right? So the, so the, the encoding of, of the value $10, the encoding of the name Bob and so on, these values are placed somewhere in the encoding of the transaction. A man in the browser malware has to know where these values are placed exactly and modify those exact values in order for their attack to succeed. If the man in the browser malware doesn't know where these values are located precisely, it won't be able to modify those values. And along the same lines, if let's say a bank changes the way that its web page is laid out, then the man in the middle Trojan may not be able to modify the transaction confirmation details. It may not be able to modify, for example, things like the bank balance appearing on the user's 
uh, bank webpage because it may not know exactly where that bank balance is located. So ultimately, the man in the browser trojan has to understand not just how to compromise the system, but it has to understand exactly where on a bank's webpage, exactly uh, where during the course of the transaction certain values are placed. And it's got to be able to do that at a low level so it can mount the attack. If it doesn't know that information, if that information is changing, if the layout is changing, if the way that the transaction is encoded, if that changes, then the man in the browser trojan will have a harder time being able to modify the transaction in a malicious or unintended way. Now, I also do want to point out that one issue that a lot of banks have is that they don't want to modify their web pages too much in general because if they modify their web page a lot, then their users may get confused. Their users may not be able to understand how to make a transaction. So every time a bank modifies its page, it now creates a new usability issue. So it's kind of solved one problem of addressing a man in the browser attack, but now they've introduced a new problem potentially of usability. Because if I go to my bank's website and I see a different page every time where everything is located in a different place, you know, I may also get confused. Uh, so not only will they confuse the malware, they may actually confuse the user who is using that site. So it's something that a lot of banks have to consider. So in any event, these are the main countermeasures for dealing with man in the browser attacks.